on you. Okay, we'll start off that last ten seconds. Good questions before we begin. Okay, let's begin. Welcome back. Um, today I'm going to provoke more questions than I'm going to answer. This whole class is going to be answering this basic question: is how do you infer a parameter from a distribution? And there's lots of ways you can do it. And the name of the game is. What properties do you want out of this estimator? Why do you choose certain estimators? So we can always estimate something. The question is, is how good is it? And so maybe I say my estimator for something is seven. So from this distribution, just my estimator is always seven. And seven would be hard to beat if that actually were seven. So it would be something that you could never beat. If I always pick theta to be seven, and my estimator was always seven, regardless of what data I saw, you wouldn't be able to beat me. So, of course, we never know with that much certainty what something is. So, if the true answer was seven, I'd be giving you something that was unbiased. It's always seven. And it would have no stochasticity to it. So there's no variability to the estimator as well. And so I'd minimize both of those things simultaneously but only in the case where theta is 7. If theta was close to 7, maybe that's not too bad. Maybe it would be hard to beat. But if theta was very far from 7, then my estimator would be horribly biased. And the variability in my estimator would be 0, but my estimator would be terribly biased. And so I would be reducing the variability, but increasing bias in everything. And so there's this trade-off between these two things. So when I ask the question, what's the best estimator for the theta, you need to be giving me properties. Best in what sense? And so, and of course it depends on what you maybe know about what theta is. And so maybe theta only has some valid ranges. And maybe I need to adhere to that. And maybe estimation techniques don't always enforce all of that. And so perhaps, I'm thinking about something like an intercept in a regression model, and maybe that intercept needs to be positive. You know, but the standard least squares estimator gives me something that's negative, and it puts it into the invalid ranges. And the question is, is would you use that estimator? And so there's lots of things to consider. So in the forward problem, like in a probability class, there's an answer to everything. If I asked you what's the variance of some distribution, there's an actual answer to that if the variance exists, of course. Uh, if the variance exists and the mean's going to exist, and I can compute that exactly, or I could come as close as you want it using some approximation scheme on the computer. You tell me you need your answer within 22 decimal places, I could probably do it. Say so that, probably no need to that. So 22 places on your computer is probably something that would take an astronomical amount of computation to, to get ready. And so there's, you know, this basic question, what's theta and how do you learn it? What's the best estimator? And I'm not going to tell you the answer right now, um, but you'll be thinking about this throughout the class. And I'll probably ask you questions just like this. This question is a little bit hard because theta is on the boundary. And so that kind of makes things a little bit strange. Um, we looked at a couple of these different estimation techniques, and I threw down some. Um, I've computed several things here. And so one of the things that I've computed is the range. That's right here. That's the max minus the minimum. We'll be talking about order statistics soon, and we can figure out what the distribution of the range is. And so it's a probabilistic calculation. I'll show you how to do that soon. Um, I can look at the mid-range. This is something like the middle of the distribution. It's kind of a weird um, estimator in itself. Because I'm using order statistics, the min of the max, and then I'm averaging them in an arithmetic sense. So it's kind of weird to do that. It's like you're using the quantifiers, and then you end up averaging them. So not something people typically do. I want to point out that both of these can be used to estimate what theta is. And so my basic question might be, what's better, the range or the mid-range in all of this? And of course. I should say, I want to take the mid-range and multiply it by 2, if I was going to use that as an estimator. So let's just draw a picture. Our distribution looks like this. Uniform 
between zero and theta. The height of this thing is one over theta because it's a density. It's going to normalize to one. And I get to see some data points in here. So this is the maximum. And this is the min. The mid range is somewhere around here. If I take this and I average it with that, it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Multiplying that by 2, it's going to bring it over by theta. So the maximum minus the minimum, minimum is an estimator of 0, and that happens to be something we already know. So I'm not saying these are great estimators of theta. In fact, I wouldn't use either one of these if I were to do it. But it still provokes the question of which one is better, the mid-range times 2 or the, the range. So think about it like this. So the mid-range <coughs> times 2 is equal to xn. This is the maximum. That's going to be the notation we're going to use in this class plus x1, the minimum. So the book uses it as a convention except for one place. Um, the convention is to just put in braces to <coughs> distinguish the ordering of the elements. Right here. And the range right here is just xn, the maximum, minus some estimator of zero. And so in some sense, the max is estimating theta. And I see more and more data, that will get closer and closer to theta. And as I see more and more data, x1 will get closer and closer to zero. Now, of course, I probably wouldn't even consider using the minimum in estimating what theta is, because it's estimating something on a whole other endpoint. Um, just a real quick question, which is the better estimator? So I'll call this theta hat 2 times the mid-range, and I'll call this theta hat of the range. So when I go to estimate something, we don't say that's theta. We say it's an approximation of theta. And the typical way to distinguish that is to throw a hat over the, the symbol. That's our estimation. Which one do you think is better? You like this one? Yeah. How come? Um, so in the range, uh, we are already taking the maximum value and subtracting something else. So it would be less of a more I love that rationale. Yeah, so if you just think about this, this is always, the maximum, it's always going to be a biased estimator of theta. It's always to the left-hand side of everything. And so I would say valid estimators for theta should be over here, over to the right-hand side. They shouldn't be to the left of the maximum. I know that theta is to the right of ma the maximum, because the maximum is always to the left. So it's always biased. So I'd say theta always has to be out here, because I know the basic setup of the problem. And so Sam had made the, the observation last time. He didn't like estimators that were going to be greater than theta, but I would actually say we want estimators that are greater than the maximum. So there are some valid ranges to this. You can think about that for a moment. So, um, so I would say you always want an estimator that's over here. And this one does that, the mid-range times 2 is going to be something that's always going to live to the right-hand side of that. So that's good. And so it gives a little bit of stochasticity on the other side, and it pulls it over. I have some other estimators that we consider. So I could look at x bar, so the mean, and multiply it by 2. So another estimator might be x bar times 2. This is just 2 times the sum of the xi divided by n. It goes from 1 to n. So x bar is somewhere in here. Multiplying it by 2 is going to knock it somewhere around here. 
And maybe that can be to the right or the left hand side of theta. So I kind of like that. So I don't have any harsh boundary effect using this. So, and somebody said last time, they like this estimator. And so, and I can even understand some of the reasons why you might like that estimator. And so, I would say we always want our estimator to be to the right hand side of the maximum. So we probably want that. And this isn't always gonna do that. This could be to the left hand side of the maximum, depending on how dense the points were over here. And so it could be a little bit to the other side as well. So it could do either one. So it's not gonna adhere to that property that we always want something to the right hand side of the maximum probably. The maximum or the right hand side. Um, somebody tell me what you maybe like about this estimator. This is what the class is about. What do you, what properties do you like about your estimator? So just thinking about the valid ranges of theta, this one kind of fails the test. That one absolutely fails the test. And this one is kind of in there. So at least it, you know, in terms of the boundary condition, it's always to the right-hand side. So it might be too far to the right-hand side, however. Does anybody have any other reasons you might like this estimator? Variance. The variance. So maybe it's bringing down variance. So I can tell you it's an unbiased estimator. So that's one thing. So two times x bar, x bar itself is unbiased for theta over two. So let's just write that down. So this is unbiased. Why? Because I can look at the expectation of this, so this is going to be 2 times sum of the xi's divided by n. I goes from 1 to n. This thing can just come outside, so I can get rid of that. Same with the n, I can drag that outside as well. So this is 2 over n. This is a linear operator expectation, so I can drive, draw my summation side outside. And then I have the expectation of the xi, which is the only random component. And so we could do the calculation and figure out what this thing is. So this is just going to be the integral of x times f of x dx. And it's going to be between 0 and theta. And you can work through this thing. This is the density. It's 1 over theta. So I'll let you work through that integral, and it's going to end up being this thing is theta over 2. If you can't work through this integral, you're in the wrong class. So this is going to be 2 over n sum of the theta over 2. They're all IIDs, so they have the same distribution. The twos cancel each other. This is summing up a constant n times, so it cancels that n right there. So this is n theta over n, which is theta. So it's an unbiased estimator. So when the expectation of something is equal to that parameter, it's unbiased. And so we might think, we like this because it's unbiased. And then somebody said something about the variance. And so it turns out it does not decrease the variance as much as some of the other estimators, but it's not bad. It's okay. What other properties do you like about this? So I would say properties we like, <coughs> we might like, maybe one of them is it's unbiased. Let me just ask you guys. How many of you try to enforce the unbiasedness out of your estimators? You think of this as a strong condition you need to have. Who likes unbiased estimators? Yeah, it's like, maybe. Maybe I like them. In general, I don't really care. I just want to be close on average. 
And so being unbiased on its own is absolutely meaningless to you. If you think about something like a multimodal distribution, being right in the middle doesn't really tell you anything. So the expectation of the distribution might not be what you actually want to study. So it depends. Um, if you gave it to me, but everything else stayed the same in my estimation, then I would take it. But usually when I force unbiasedness, you usually end up driving up the variability of your estimator. And so you need to be careful about that trade-off. So what else do we like about this estimator right here? There's one thing I really like about it. it makes my life easy. The central limit theorem. So central <coughs> limit theorem applies. And we'll be studying this. This, I think, is section 5.4 or 5.5. So we're coming right up on that. And we'll go through the CLT. What does the central limit theorem say? Why do we like it? You know, the yeah, so it's telling you quite a few things. It's telling you the distribution, the estimator is n gets bigger and bigger. It gets closer and closer to the true answer. And it's telling you that that variance is decreasing. And it's telling you the distribution around that answer. And it's what we know from the CLT is it's roughly normally distributed. So asymptotically speaking, this statistic has a normal distribution. And as n gets bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more normal. And we use those approximations all the time. So without doing any complex mathematics, I kind of know what the distribution of this estimator is. So it turns out things like sums and averages are normally distributed, and we'll prove that later. And so that's a nice thing, is you could characterize the probability of everything. You could do the same thing with these, but the math is a bit harder. And so how these are distributed strongly depends on the distribution that it comes from. The CLT is a little bit different. It doesn't matter how these things are distributed, the XI, so long as that distribution has a finite variance, and that's all you need, then it will become normally distributed and increases. So that's kind of nice. So CLT applies. I still wouldn't use it because I know something better. And that's usually the name of the game. And that's what people do for research is they look at whatever the, the gold standard is for estimating something, and they try to beat it. So it's a little bit nice that there's never really an absolute answer to what's theta and do you have the absolutely best estimator? You can get that for some distributions, but in general you can't. So in a lot of cases you don't know. And in this case, it's kind of difficult to see and that boundary condition has a lot to do with it. The theta's on the boundary and down only stacks on one side of it. It makes the estimation a little bit harder. Um, Somebody came in, you don't have to, I'll put this up on Slack later on today. Somebody said, maybe I can regress onto the quantiles of the distribution. So if I equally spaced all of that and I regressed everything, because it's coming from a uniform distribution, the ordered data points should estimate the quantiles of everything. So if I had 20 points in there, the first point should be in the 5% range of the data. The last point should be in the 95% range. If we had um, 20 data points. If we had 100 data points, then I would expect the first one to be somewhere around here in the first quantile. So the 1% quantile. And so I could regress all of my data onto those. Somebody came up with this. I said I would cook it up for them um, and show them that that's a terrible estimator. So, but the idea was, is, well, you're using more of the data than just the max in the min. So we can at least simulate and try to see what the, which one of these is better. I put down another estimator called the Bayes estimator. With the Bayes estimator in this case, I need to teach you about Bayes. I need to tell you what prior I used, but the Bayes estimator in this case is using a um, power prior. So I'll just write that in with a power prior. The prior looks like this, one over theta. I guess in my case, it's one over A raised to some power K. We'll talk about that later. So I often ask this question. 
people to work out what these estimators are, but we're going to have to go through some decision theory before you understand them all of the foundations of coming up with these sorts of estimators. But at the end of the day, the Bayes estimator using this sort of a prior, and it depends on what I choose K to be, it's gonna give you a scaling of the maximum. And so I have to tell you a lot of stuff before I can derive that for you. But a scaling of the maximum kind of makes sense. She may have come up with this and just said, I don't know, I just know the maximum is a good estimator of theta itself. When we talk about likelihood functions, we're going to figure out that the likelihood function depends only on the maximum of the distribution. And so the parameter is only influenced by the maximum of that distribution. And so Bayes estimator using this sort of a prior scales the maximum. And so in this case, this is just a little bit bigger than the maximum, n plus 1 over n. And that's important. I want to scale it with something that's greater than 1. I wouldn't want to scale this with something less than 1 because it's just going to pull me farther away from the theta. So there's a little bit of insight. Scaling something by the maximum but making sure that scaling factor is greater than 1 is probably important. I'll also say that this parameter theta is a scale parameter. And so there's a little bit of insight there as well. Is coming up with a scaling of the minimal sufficient statistic is probably the right thing to do. So we need to build up a lot of theory before we can understand all of these principles. Um, there's another estimator that I wrote down and I commented out, n plus 2 over n plus 1. That's also a, something that's bigger than the maximum. And maybe this is a better answer. And I'll just give you a heads up. It turns out this one right here is unbiased, this estimator. You might be able to figure out this out just by looking at the quantiles of everything. So remember, if this was maybe 100 data points, this should be in the 99th quantile. So what is this estimating? This would end up being 1.01, this number right here. And so it would be a quantile shoved over. So we expect that biggest data point to be somewhere around here, within 1%, if I had n being 100. So there's a little bit of insight there that this might be unbiased. You would need to work out what the distribution of the maximum is, and I'll teach you how to do that next week. So, um, and if you don't remember what those formulas are, I'll make sure that you can remember what your joint order statistic distributions are by drawing you a picture that you'll be able to remember. Um, turns out this estimator corresponding to n plus 2 over n plus 1 is minimal MSE. It's biased, but it brings down the variance. And it turns out that it's closer on average in the two norm sense, the squared error sense. So all things that I'm just kind of provoking you, things that we're going to be thinking about later. So what I did below is I ended up just printing out um, what the estimators were. I ended up showing you the histograms of them. We can look at those real quickly. And then I ended up computing the MSC, the mean squared error of everything. And for those of you that know, MSC is the expectation squared plus the variance. So the mean squared error, if you want to know what that is, you take the error, you square it, then you take the mean of all of those. So if you just read it in reverse, MSC is a well-named thing. It tells you exactly how to calculate it. It turns out, and we'll show this later, and most of you will know this, that the expectation squared plus the variance is MSE. And that's the way that I've encoded this. So I took the expectation, the mean of whatever it is, subtract off the truth, and then I squared it. So this is the bias squared plus the variance of my estimator. And I computed that for all of them. So I picked a norm. So it turns out if I wanted to minimize this quantity, right here, the MSE, then I should probably have that as part of my objective. And it turns out, this estimator right here that I'm not going to show you, but you can uncomment and play with the code if you want, this is the minimal MSE estimator in the class of estimators that is a scaled maximum. And it would be extremely hard to beat this estimator if we used MSE. You would need to tell me something that you knew about theta, that I picked thetas in particular ranges. If you knew that and you use that information, you might be able to beat this. Okay, let's see how they all do. 
So I'm provoking you a little bit more. They study this distribution in the book in chapter 5, and they draw you this picture of what the joint distribution of the range and the mid-range is. And they do this as an exercise so you can work with order statistics and learn what their distributions are and how you work through joint distributions. The hardest part of this um, problem is figuring out what the boundaries are, just like in any calculus problem. When you're playing around, what are the boundaries of your integrals? And this will be the hardest integral that we study in this class. Um, I won't ask you to do something like that on a midterm. And I ended up drawing a distribution of all of these different estimators. So let's just look at what I've done up here. So I just threw everything into a for loop. We're going to do this regularly in this class. So we'll try to build up our intuition through simulations, and then we can work through the math. So, and I encourage you to always do that for every problem. Could you simulate the answer? And it'll make sure that you never get stuck. And if you do work out things mathematically, you'll always be able to check compared to your simulation. And if your math ends up agreeing with the simulation, you probably did everything right. So if the math doesn't agree with what you get out of the simulation, at least one of them are wrong. So you always want to uh, wait to double check everything. So I'd say nowadays, it's quite a bit different than the way it used to be, Everything should be done on a computer. So just to verify your mathematics, at least. So what we've done is we've just computed. So what I've done is I've built up some big number of replicates. So I've gone into this distribution. I've sampled n data points. I end up having a toggle for that. n is 20. So I get that many data points. I'm going to sample that from my distribution. So this is a random uniform right here. So rand is a uniform distribution. I end up telling it how many samples I want out of it. I want a vector of 1n. So that's just an n vector. I could end up getting everything in a matrix format if I wanted to have replicates built into that. And this would be the faster way to do it. I buried it into a for loop just so you can see this conceptually. So if you're actually coding this up, for your own simulation, I would probably do this in a vectorized way, where I plug the replicates in right here and get a big matrix of all of the data all at once. So this is a little bit slow, but at least it's conceptual. Multiplying everything by A, that's our theta in the problem, ends up making everything into a uniform zero theta. So I just transformed a random variable and got what I wanted. Pretty simple conceptual transformation. <coughs> So I get my vector of data. That's my 20 data points that I'm illustrating here. And then I compute these statistics and I store them. And I do it over and over and over again. So I want to see, as I repeat this process, how good those estimators are and what the distribution of those estimators is. And that's what statisticians do, is we try to characterize the distribution of things. So, and then we make probabilistic statements. So I just collect these over and over again. I just ran everything, and this is what we get. We can stare at this. So this is my range right here, and what we can see is that the estimator is always to the left of 100. And so the mid-range divided by 2 overlaps 100, and I kind of like this when I see it, that everything is kind of symmetric on the left and the right-hand side. So that has some nice properties to it. Two times x bar, same sort of thing, but if I look at these ranges right here, that's an 80, that's a 120, you not, might not be able to see that, but this over here is a 50 and that's a 150. And so it's wider. And so what we can already see is that both of these estimators right here are unbiased. We just proved it for this one right here. Um, I take it back, this isn't necessarily unbiased, but it's going to break down the bias compared to just looking at the range. We'll have to look at that. So you can work out that distribution later on, figure out what the bias of it is. But it doesn't look like it's too biased right here, but the variance is tighter. And so we want an estimator that brings down the variance. So while the central limit theorem does something for us, and I can say uh, these things are normally distributed. That's what the central limit theorem is telling us, the distribution of all of that. If I didn't know that and I just simulated it, I wouldn't need to know it. And I could just look at this empirical distribution that I've just come up with. If you did know math, and you could work out that it's a normal distribution, 
that will obviate some of your computational costs. So there's good reasons to understand the math as well. Um, but I would say this is a better estimator already just by looking at these two different distributions. So here's my least squares estimator. It's pretty biased. It's always getting biased to the left as I end up doing that regression. Um, the variance isn't too terrible, but we can see already that this is a better estimator. So let me just um, ask you a few questions about this. Let's just, this one is the scale maximum right here. And it's got kind of a weird distribution. I will say, I like this answer. This one's pretty good. And it's hard to beat. So in the MSE sense, it is beatable, but I just use that other Bayes estimator that I'll teach you how to derive later on. Um, how many data points did we use? Let's just look at this one. This is the easy question. This is two times x bar. How many data points did we use in creating this estimator? All of them. We use n of them. So two times x bar is this thing. All the data points are going in there. So I used all my data to do that. Same thing happens for this least square thing. And it's a weird estimator. So it's just neat to think about different ways to do estimations and then ask your question, your, yourself, what are the properties of my estimator? So we used all the data points here. Let me just ask this question. For the scale maximum, how many data points did we use? One. Some people say one. Who says one? Who says something different than one? Sam does. So it doesn't have to do with the replication. To find the maximum, I needed to order everything. So you needed to order the whole data set. So I've used all the data points to figure out which one is the maximum. So you need to do a comparison to everything. So even though it looks like I've only used one data point, and that's what inclined this he was a physics student, so they come up with things that are kind of weird sometimes. Sometimes it even works. Um, thought that I should be using all the data. All the data is being used right here. So just to kind of point that out. All the data is being used here, and all the data is being used here as well. So all those estimators use all of the data. So I can end up looking at their actual MSEs. <clears throat> And they're down here. So for our first thing, it's 127, the range, in terms of the bias squared plus the variance. Pretty big number. Two times the mid-range is quite a bit smaller. And so this is better. <coughs> so the MSE for two times the mean is 163, so it's very large. So it turns out the central limit theorem isn't enough to bring down all that variance. Not for this problem. Maybe for some other problems. So this one, the quantile estimator is not very good, and the Bayes estimator is better. So that's a 22 right here. Let's just see. I think what I said is when I end up using this estimator right here, I end up bringing down MSE even a little bit more. So let me just substitute these and see if we can beat that 22 number. <clears throat> I'll put it over here so I can remember it for next time. So let's just rerun everything. So just remember 2205. slightly different distributions, and lo and behold, it turned out it was a little bit higher. It should have been lower, but I need to crank up my replications. They're close. They're super competitive with each other. I want to point out a few other things. I was hoping that would be smaller, but again, this isn't averaging, and so they're really close to each other. Question in the back? Yes. Um, professor, what if for this example we had 
perform bootstrapping to find more if I bootstrap? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Which test statistic would you use for your bootstrap? I would use the mean. You'd use the mean. Yeah. So it turn out you would end up deriving the central limit theorem all over again. Yeah. And so we'll see that next later on this week. So we're going to be jumping into bootstrap almost immediately. Um, so it would be very, very similar to invoking the CLT. So if you didn't know the CLT, but you knew how to bootstrap things, you would end up deriving something really close. And I'll demonstrate that to you later in the week. <coughs> so good question, Jay. Good to see you. I didn't recognize you, but I, I recognize your voice very well. Um, okay. I want to just look at a few other things just real quickly. That if I ended up increasing the data size, let's just make that 50, I do better. And I think everybody can understand that. All these estimators will benefit. So if I remember what those numbers are approximately, I rerun everything, all those numbers come down dramatically. So I don't even have to remember all the numbers. I can just see that they've all decreased because I have the old numbers right there. And so seeing more data helps us. And we know that intuitively. If you ever have an estimation problem where more data hurts you, that's a problem. So, and I've seen problems like that, that it increases the complexity of the space that you work in. This problem isn't like that. So more data ends up helping you. So I want to also point out that the inference is determined by A, which is theta, as well. If I end up making A bigger, my technique gets worse. So, and the reason why is pretty obvious. It's just the sparsity of everything. But if we're thinking in terms of the max having more F information, if N is big relative to this interval length, then I'm going to be closer to that end point. And so people ask all the time, what should N be? And I always say it depends on the problem. How sparse is your problem? <coughs> what are you trying to estimate? And so all that stuff that you've learned before saying something like, um, let's end up making that a thousand, where people say N31 is good, you're going to forget all of that in this class. So those are just obnoxious answers to those. So let's just run it again. I ended up making A much bigger. I rerun everything again. Distributions are going to look similarly, but the MSEs are going to explode. So I get a worse answer, and it's just because of how much data is being budged against theta itself. So this gap is getting bigger and bigger as I make A big relative to the sample size. Any questions about that? I'll put this code out there and you can play around with it a little bit. But really, this is just supposed to provoke you into what should you do, what questions should you be answering. Okay. Let's jump into sampling with and without replacement. This is going to form the basis for something called the bootstrap. And if you have familiarity with it, great. We'll be jumping straight into it. They don't introduce the bootstrap until chapter 10. But I think it's an important thing that we just get out of the way. So I used to hate the bootstrap, and now I like it. So the reason I hate it is because conceptually and mathematically, there's nothing to it. So you don't have to be brilliant to use the thing. Um, it doesn't work in all cases. It works in cases where things are IID. So there are things called block bootstrapping, where you can um, pick up dependencies and try to carry it over. We're not going to cover that in this class. So sampling with replacement. Say I've got some problem, and I have x's are coming from some distribution f. So I'm just going to write that down. I'm not going to tell you what the f depends on, but this is some distribution right here. And I'll say I'm sampling in an IID fashion. And I don't know much about this distribution, but I collect a vector of samples, x1 to xn. We're going to be using this notation throughout the class. And possibly I want to estimate something using this data. Um, we'll leave that out for now. 
So a sample from replacement. with replacement doesn't change the distribution. <laughs> so this data is distributed according to F, and I can come in and I can sample with replacement where I grab one of these draws, and so I'm gonna grab the draw, so I'll just write down x is my random variable, and I end up grabbing one of these xi's. The xi's come from here. The probability of grabbing a particular xi from this distribution is one over n. And if I wanted to order all of this, so I'm just gonna give you some notation right here. I'm gonna say this is my first draw. So this is draw one. The book ends up making this a round brace, and they confuse that notation with what they do in the next section because they use that throughout the book to indicate order statistics. So I'm going to change the notation a little bit and just put in a brace and say, this is just my first draw. I've only drawn once from this. And the probability of grabbing that particular value xi, which could have been any one of these things that came from f in the first place, um, it's one over n. So what I've done is I've sampled uniformly from something that came from f. So I'm sampling uniformly from f. And that's the terminology that we use. And so my second draw, my probability, so this is my second draw in my notation. What I do in sampling with replacement is I take this value and I throw it back into my collection of n draws, reshuffle everything, reach into it, and I grab something from the second draw. This is going to be xj, given that I sampled something on my first draw. So this is my first draw right here, and I'm going to say I grab xi right here. And xi could be xj because I've replaced it. And so what's the probability that I grab some other thing conditional on I've sampled once and I cut everything back, I haven't changed the distribution. So this stays one over n. So the distribution stays the same. And what I'm really doing by resampling from x is I'm just taking draws from f in the first place. So a sample from a sample is a sample. So I haven't changed anything. So without replacement, it's a little bit different. And this is what most people end up doing when they do sample surveying and whatever. What you probably should do if you want to stick in the IIB case, and I'll just keep in mind, these draws right here are IIB because the original draws were IIB. So the distribution doesn't change, and I'm doing the same sampling procedure every single time. Without replacement, it does change the distribution a little bit. So the probability of x1 being equal to xi is going to be 1 over n. But then my probability of my next draw, x2, being equal to xj, given that x1 is equal to xi, this distribution changes. And so if xj is equal to xi, I, I've sampled this one and I don't replace it back into my vector, I've removed it. The probability of me getting xi on the next draw is zero. I should point out, these could have the same values multiple times in here, but I'm talking about getting the exact replicate, not its value. So if xj is xi, there's no way I can get it because I removed it from the vector. So and if xj is not xi, then I've changed the distribution. There's n minus 1 things in there. I'm going to sample uniformly from that vector, and I've changed it. So pretty easy to see. The marginal distributions do stay the same. 
So they say this in the book, we'll just write it out. And we'll conclude and we'll pick up with the bootstrap next time. So in sampling without replacement, the margins are preserved. What I'm really asking about is what's the probability that on my second draw I end up seeing xj marginally, not conditionally. And it turns out this is 1 over n as well. And so we can see that just by marginalizing out of the conditional distribution. So I'm going to look at probability that x2, my second draw, is equal to xj given the probability that, let me write this out as a conditional, given x1 is equal to xi times the probability that x1 is equal to xi. We know what this thing is, it's 1 over n, that's our first draw. In this, I'm going to marginalize over n things. So if I want to come up with just the marginal distribution, I have to marginalize out of the process, and the conditionals are changing depending on what I've sampled on the first draw. And so we've just said that this is 1 over n for most of these, but one of them is a 0. So it's going to be the, the one that's a zero corresponds to the xi that we've drawn the first time. And so I'm going to sample, I'm going to add this up n times, and this is going to be 1 over n for most of them except for one of them. And so this is going to be 1 over n minus 1 except for the one that's zero. How many of these are 1 over n minus 1? n minus 1. So there's n minus 1 of those times this times 1 over n. There's a 0 in here if you'd like to add it in. So this is going to be plus 0. I usually don't add that in. So the n minus 1's cancel, and I'm left with 1 over n. And they cover that in the book. So you can read through that if I did that a little too quickly. So sampling without replacement is very simple is what they end up saying in the book, and I think you've all seen this in any Stat 101 class, and if n is large, it doesn't matter. So bootstrapping is going to exploit sampling with replacement, and if I sample from a sample, I still have a sample. So I do change some of the related structure, but I don't change any of the margins also. We're going to come back next time, and we'll study bootstrapping and see how it compares to Jenny's question, what if we bootstrapped? When we were computing x bar, it turned out you would recreate something very similar to the central limit there. That's it for now, you guys. We'll start picking up complexity in this class. So even though right now everything is simple and the homework problems are relatively simple, just keep reading through the text because it's going to get more complicated. Thanks, you guys. Have a great week. I'll see you on Wednesday. Also, we won't do a review session tomorrow because there's nothing to review. So probably next week.